Hi, my name is Pastor Daniel. I'm so excited you're taking an opportunity to watch this sermon. We believe that any time we open the Word of God that we have an opportunity to be changed because the Bible is the actual live Word of our Heavenly Father. And we hope that this impacts you in a positive way. A quick word of caution, and that is that this sermon that you're about to watch is by no means uh, the church. It's not a substitute for a church. It's not a substitute for a pastor in your life. The church is not a building. The church is the body of Christ, a group of believers doing life together, worshiping and pursuing Jesus together. In no way should this be any sort of primary discipleship in your life, and in no way should this replace the pastor that somewhere God has called to shepherd you. We hope sincerely that you're part of a local church somewhere. And if you're not, I want to encourage you to go find a local church to be part of, because for all of the ups and downs and messiness of the local church, the Bible calls it the Bride of Christ. It is the hope of the world. And you need to be part of one because it'll help. If you don't know where or how to find a local church, we'd love to help. You can simply go to our website and email us at hello at resurrect.church. And we'll do our best to plug you in. We appreciate your time. We hope that this supplementary discipleship impacts you in a positive way. We believe the Bible has a profound impact on us when we allow God to speak to us. Thanks. See you. Such a vast, unsearchable greatness. Great is Yahweh, worthy of all our praise. Let your people sound through the ages. All your awesome works till the end of days. Morning. My name is Pastor Daniel. I'm one of the lead pastors here. Uh, last week, I got to preach for the first time in eight weeks. And so, uh, you know, because it had been a while, I ended up in first service going <clears throat> 55 minutes <clears throat> long. And uh, afterwards, they're like, Daniel, did you know you preached for 55 minutes? And I was like, oh, I did not. So I fixed that in second service, and I went for 61 minutes. Uh, <laughs> you're welcome. We're in a series called The Apostles' Creed where we're looking at one of the oldest creeds of the Christian faith. And uh, it's simply a statement of belief. It's like a summary of things that we've found in scripture. And so we're going backwards. We're taking the summary of things that we found in scripture and we're, we're breaking them down and saying, is this true? Did this come from scripture? Where did we get this? Why do we believe this? Why should we believe this? And that should be of significant interest to you if you are following this guy named Jesus because you really shouldn't care what I have to say at all unless it's in scripture. Because if what you're hearing from me or anyone else isn't actually validated by God's word, his infallible, inerrant word, then it's just, it will be difficult to actually judge the value of that. And so in, in every area of life as we're pursuing Jesus, what we're doing is we're opening up the word of God, we're allowing that living word to change us to transform us, to impact our lives. And so today we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna take a look at this statement and then we're gonna open scripture and we're gonna just walk through it. And there's a statement here in our Apostles' Creed. Last week we looked at what it looked like for Jesus to descend into hell and then in three days rise again. And today we're gonna look at the next statement in the Apostles' Creed, which is that he ascended to heaven and sits on the right hand, sits on the right hand of the Father Almighty. He ascended to heaven and sits on the right hand of the Father Almighty. Now, this is commonly referred to as the ascension of Christ. And the interesting part of the ascension of Christ is it's, of all the doctrinal stuff that we'll look at in the Apostles' Creed, it's probably the mo most overlooked one. In fact, uh, uh, Rachel Parrish was telling me, because when we, we set up our series and our worship, we look for the themes in each of the weeks, and she lines out different songs that match that. And she's like, there are no songs on the ascension of Christ. We have to pick something else. Like we, there aren't really any books written on it. We don't talk about it very often and we don't sing about it. That's why we couldn't find any songs on it. So why should you care? Why is it even in here? Why does the ascension of Christ matter? We're gonna open up scripture. We're gonna look at what the Bible says about 
the ascension of Jesus Christ to the right hand of the Father. And then we're gonna talk about whether or not it matters. And uh, spoiler alert, it matters. It matters. It matters to you and I. It doesn't just matter doctrinally. It matters in our everyday life. And we're going to talk a little bit, by the end, I hope to have convinced you uh, of, of a few things in which you can look at the ascension of Christ as an encouragement, as a motivation, as a reminder for some very specific things that we're going to be doing in this Christian life, that we're called to do in this Christian life. And so I, I want you to leave today with an understanding that it matters and that it's something that if you thought about more would actually encourage you and it would motivate you and it would help you in this Christian walk. And so we're going to start in Acts chapter 1. And we're going to go through verses 1 through 11. This is going to be our primary text today. We're going to break this down. If you're not familiar with Acts, Acts was a, is a history book written by Luke, who also wrote the Gospel of Luke. And he is writing this uh, primarily to kind of convince uh, this, this uh, Roman named Theopolis of uh, the, the story of Jesus, so basically uh, the, the, the reality of the gospel. And so it's a, it's a historical narrative, unlike the gospels are a little bit different, they're more personal testimony. And Acts is, is kind of a record of the church and what happened after the resurrection. And so we're gonna start in the very beginning, the very first verse of this book, and we're gonna look at what happened after the resurrection for 11 verses here, here we go. In the first book, he's actually referring to his Gospel of Luke, O Theopolis, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. So his first book, the Gospel of Luke, is about Jesus' life and death and resurrection. Verse two, until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. So this is all after the resurrection. Here's what Jesus did. Verse four. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. That is quite the story. That's how you, that's how you start your, uh, your history book. I tell you, if history book started this interesting in school, I would have actually paid attention. All right. Let's start in verse four and five real quick. So I want you to see what happens. Jesus comes back. He's now appeared uh, to multiple people and to his apostles and his disciples and to some of his followers. And so over the, the course of these 40 days, he's actually appeared in a lot of different places. But he gives them this command. It says, and while staying with them, says verse four, and while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem. So stay here. And then he says, but to wait for the promise of the Father. Wait. Don't, don't, I've given you a commission. I've given you the great commission. I've told you you have things to do, but, but you're going to wait. And there's a, there's a very specific reason that they need to wait. They're not yet equipped to do what he wants them to go do. They've not yet been empowered to do what he wants them to go do. So wait. And then he tells them why. Wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now, what's interesting as uh, we read through the first three, four, five verses of this and we get to this point is Jesus is in the upper room and he's eating with them. And you're like, why is that significant? Because Jesus was physically resurrected from the dead. Yes. They, they touched his side. They saw his wounds. He's eating food with them. Ghosts don't eat a lot of food. Spirit people don't get hungry. He's still human. It was a physical, bodily resurrection. Amen. So here he is in the upper room eating food and giving them instructions. And he reminds them, he says this to them. This is a quote, you heard from me. So wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. Now, the promise of the Father, he says, 
is, hey, John, this is uh, John the Baptist, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit, if we go back to what the apostles would have thought about this, they're going to connect this to some prophecies in the Old Testament because they know nothing of the Holy Spirit yet. The only time they've, they've actually seen the Holy Spirit is when Jesus gets baptized and the Spirit comes and descends upon Jesus. Um, they get to see some of these instances, but they've read about this because they've studied the scriptures. And so they know God's Spirit. They, they, there's some prophecy tied to this. In Isaiah 44, 3, it says this, for I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my Spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. So there are prophecies that these disciples have read in scripture that there's going to be a point, and I'm gonna tie this together for you in just a second, in which God's spirit will come in a way that it's never come before. In Jeremiah 31, 33, there's a prophecy that says this, for this is the covenant that I make that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, so there's a prophecy in the future, declares the Lord, I will put my law within them, because the law wasn't within them. Where was it? It had to be written on stone tablets and taught to them because it wasn't in them. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. There's gonna be something internal that happens. Well, the law is now not an external force, but an internal force, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Joel 2, 28 through 29. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions even on the male and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit. And Jesus has actually talked about this before he went to the cross. In John 14, really most of John 14, he's actually talking about this. But in verses 16 and 17, he specifically says this. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. So, so the Holy Spirit, in the way that we will talk about him as the Christian church, and the way that we will talk about him in the New Testament, and we, we'll look at all these letters to churches, and, and we'll refer to the Holy Spirit, is not how the Spirit worked in the Old Testament. That's not what the apostles understand from studying scripture. The, the, God's Spirit in the Old Testament came in a very different way. It would, it would descend at times and, and be up upon an individual, usually kings or prophets, so if we go back in the Old Testament, there'll be a time where, you know, you see the story of Samson, and it says, like, God's spirit rushed upon him, and then he killed a bunch of people with a donkey jawbone. Like, let's forget about that part for right now. But some miracle would happen, right? Because God's spirit would come down, and it would fill someone. So King David, God's spirit would come down, descend upon him in a certain time, in a certain place, and it was temporary. It didn't stay with him. So, so God's spirit at different times in these thousands of years leading up to this point, when God's spirit would happen, it was rare occurrence. It didn't happen very often. It was of note. And then it wouldn't stay. It, wouldn't, 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 it would leave. And so that's the only experience that the disciples have with God's spirit. And yet there's a prophecy that there's going to be a day, there's going to be a time in which it's not going to be this rare occurrence and it's not going to be a temporary thing and it's not going to come and it's not going to leave. But instead, I'm going to do an internal change in you and my spirit's going to dwell with you and I'm going to change who you are on the inside. And I'm going to take that law that you can't seem to even stand up to and you can't seem to keep and you're really hypocritical and, and, and terrible at it, but I'm going to write it inside of you. It's a day coming that's going to happen. And Jesus tells them that before he goes to the cross. Listen, there's going to be, there's a time coming where my spirit's going to come. It's going to be unlike anything that you've ever seen before. God's going to move in a way that you aren't used to. The spirit's coming. Verse six. So when they had come together, They asked him. So they hear this. They're listening to Jesus. As much as uh, much criticism as we give the apostles, they're trying to listen, right? They listen to what he says. And they ask this question. So when they come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, why did they ask that question in response to, my spirit is coming? For us, that's a weird thing. And so you could read that and go, man, they were really... uh, 
really kind of consumed with this idea of restoration of the kingdom. I wonder why they asked that. They asked that because in the Old Testament, in all those prophecies that I read you where the Holy Spirit was going to come in this different way, those were actually all tied to the prophecy that God was going to restore the kingdom. And so when Jesus says, I'm going to send my spirit, they're like, oh, that, that, means, that means you're going to restore the kingdom of God. And so they ask, wait a minute, if, that, if that's true, are, when is this going to happen? Now, here's the problem. They were, they were kind of right and they were kind of wrong. They had a little of both here. They believed that the coming Messiah and that the coming of the Holy Spirit marked the coming of the prophesied kingdom. And they were right and they were wrong. So, but here's the why. When they, and this is just the way it had been taught, this is the way they looked at it, when they thought that the kingdom was going to be restored, what they were thinking in their mind, the way that they decided that that was gonna happen is that the restoration of the kingdom of God in Israel was gonna be a restoration of the might and the power and the authority of the kingdom of Israel like in the days of David and Solomon. So what they were thinking was, hey, I wanna, we, wanna, we, want that, we wanna go back to when Israel was a world power. We wanna go back to when everyone bowed down to us. We want to go back to when you put the Jews in our rightful place and we were the most exalted people group in the world and everybody else had to come pay us tribute. Which isn't what it was at all. But, but, but in, the, in their mindset, and not just them, but in all of the Jews' mindset, God's restored kingdom was about their glory, not God's. You ever have a picture in your head of how God's gonna do something and if it doesn't do it the way that you think that it should happen, there's a problem? And so here's the, the question that they're asking is this, wait a minute, if this is the fulfillment of prophecies, Jesus, when are we gonna rule the Romans? When are we gonna stop being subjugated to all of this? When, when are we gonna be on top again? God's kingdom it revolves around us. When's that gonna happen? See, this is just the, the nature of us in our sinful nature is that every time we see kingdom things, or every time we see God move, some, for some reason, we think it's all about us. So God moves in some mighty way and the first thing we think is like, I bet that's about me. Or something great happens, you're like, I bet they're talking about me. Copernicus uh, in, in 1543 came up with this revolutionary idea. Uh, up until that point, for the most part, no one considered that the earth was not the center of the universe. So everybody, with only rare exception, in the history of sort of science, had just sort of agreed upon, you know, the science is settled, everything revolves around the earth. And Copernicus began to poke at that and was the first one that actually proved through a scientific theory that actually the galaxy we're in revolves around the sun, not around the earth. Now you're thinking, hey, that's pretty cool. Science is cool, right? We learned some new stuff. It wasn't cool for Copernicus because essentially he gets censored by the church. And, and the books that he's reading and writing from in the scientific theory all get banned by the church because he's decided that like we're not the center of the universe. How controversial is that? Hey, you're, you're not actually, it's not all about you. You're banned. I don't think I can be friends with them anymore. I mean, they're always like so negative. You're not, it's really not all about you. Oh, how dare you. This is our human nature. We are self-absorbed narcissists. Let me help right now. It's not about me. Amen. Let me help you. It's not about you. Amen. It's not about us. My job up here uh, on a Sunday when I get to preach the word of God to you is not hopes that you, you, you're paying attention to me. It's that you get to see a little bit more of Jesus. And our job in a broken world is not that people will notice us, it's that they get to see a little bit more of Jesus. And, and, and it's very easy, it's a very slippery slope to, to fall down to the idea that it should be about me and that I should get the notoriety, that I should get the affirmation, that I should get the acceptance, that I should get the encouragement, but in reality, we're just here to try to point them to Jesus. 
And so the Jews are just off, right? They're like, hey, when are you going to do it? And it's going to happen in this way. And Jesus is like, (laughs) guys, he says this in verse seven. He says to them, this is a very gentle rebuke, by the way. He's not always gentle with them. He's very gentle with them here. He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the father has fixed by his own authority. That is very gentle. It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the father has fixed by his own authority. So so the first thing you should remember is every time you hear someone tell you that they have figured out when Jesus is coming again, (laughs) would you please just read your Bible? Just, just read your Bible and stop that. But what is he trying to tell them? He just told them that he's going to send the Holy Spirit. And, and, and actually, we'll go back to John 14, and, and we'll know that Jesus has told them that when the Holy Spirit comes, that they're going to have such power because of the presence of the Holy Spirit, that, man, they're going to do miracles greater than even Jesus. They're going to do things and achieve things for the gospel that are greater than even what Jesus did during his ministry. I mean, he he said, like, man, the power that you're going to have and the presence of the Holy Spirit is going to be an amazing thing. And then what he says when they ask is, like, but you're not going to get to know all of the details of how it works. And and this is, let me just be be, be really clear. This This is a microcosm of the Christian walk. Be okay in the unknown. Because you're going to live life in the unknown. That is a life by faith. That's how it's going to work. Like, listen to me. Um, God is still in charge even if you don't understand it. I, you need to hear that because I, I talk to people all the time that, that they, if they can't see every detail, like step one, two, three, three A, three B, three B part one, like they're like, I don't know if God's in charge. I'm like, he's still in charge. God is still in charge if you can't explain how it works. God is still sovereign if you don't know how something's gonna happen. That's just, so, so listen, just because you can't explain how he parted the Red Sea doesn't mean it didn't happen. I mean, imagine standing there, he parts the Red Sea, and you're like, I'm not sure I can scientifically explain that, so I'm just going to not believe it's happening right now. <laughs> you're not going to always know the details. I, I read a great quote I want to read you about trusting the Father's plan. It says this, the disciples wanted to know Jesus' timetable for the restoration of the kingdom. Like other Jews, the disciples chafed under their Roman rulers. They wanted Jesus to free Israel from Roman power and then become their king. Jesus replied that God the Father sets the timetable for all events, worldwide, national, and personal. If you want changes that God isn't making immediately, don't become impatient. Instead, trust God's timetable. Remember that he is wise, good, and all-powerful. Even when things seem chaotic, he is in control. His perfect will ultimately will prevail. So, so the, the Israelites are going through the wilderness in Exodus as God is leading them and manna is raining down from heaven every day so that they can eat. Well, I can't explain how that's happening, so I guess I'm just going to starve. I need someone to explain how that's happening. God said it would happen. The, the, when Jesus says you have to have a childlike faith, hear me, hear me. There's a reason he has to point you at a child and tell you, stop trying to figure it out. Jesus heals someone from something that should be incurable, and you're like, well, we can't figure out how that happened. I can. He said it would happen. See, let me just, let me just give you this. One of the, one of the secret little things that, that we don't talk about enough about our human nature, about, about well, the sinful nature is this. Um, we, we actually only want to explain how something happens so we can see if we can find a way to control it. And, and, I, and I hate that that's the way, but it, it's just the way, okay? So we can, we, we can try to justify this desire to explain it out of curiosity, but it's not really curiosity. It's a desire to control it because we want to master it because the original sin all the way back in Genesis 3 is that they wanted to be like God. 
And so your desire to put your hands on that steering wheel and make your own decisions, decisions and be the king of your own life is so strong that you will justify that as, well, I just want to know how it works. No, you don't. You want to run everything. Because he's in his throne and you want to sit there. But it's not your seat. And you couldn't handle it if you sat in it. And every time you've had the decisions and the authority over your own life to make decisions, it's ended up a mess. (laughs) So cut it out. Be okay in the unknown. Because the Christian life is one that we live by faith in the unknown. Now, he's very gentle with them. He's going to give him that, that wonderful three-letter word, but, but. So he says, it's not for you to know the time and the place of the Father. It's not for you to know this. You don't have to be able to explain this. You don't, you don't need to know all the details of God's plan, but, but you will, this is verse eight, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So, so you, you're, you're not going to get, you're not going to get the power of knowing all the details. You're not going to get the power of being able to explain it all or control it all or put your hands on it or take credit for it. But you will get power through faith. So in the unknown where you can't control it and you can't explain it, you're going to receive power. And, and, and we're going to look at John 14 again Really, John 14 is Jesus calling his shot before it ever happens. He talks in detail about what the Spirit is going to do and the representation of the Spirit here on earth. We're not talking about the Holy Spirit a ton today. That's actually part of the creed in a couple weeks. We'll we'll cover it then. But I do want uh, to just, uh, this is just an observation. Verse eight, just verse eight by itself, one single verse is really, first of all, it is actually the last statement recorded by Christ on earth, verse eight. Okay, so if you just circle, that's the last thing Jesus said that we have recorded in human history. The second thing is this. In that statement, in that one verse, is wrapped the entire vision of the church. The vision of the church, all four of the major things that we're supposed to be doing and how we're doing it is all wrapped in one verse, in verse eight. The people for the task. The people for the task. Who who is it? Well, it's those that know Jesus. That's what he says right here. If you know me, this is, who, this is who's in charge. This is who's supposed to be going and doing this, the people that know Jesus, the Christ followers. You can call them whatever you, you want, but if you follow Jesus, you're part of this group, the people for the task. Secondly, he tells you in verse eight, the power for the task. So the actually empowerment, the way that you're gonna go get this thing done is the Holy Spirit is, I'm gonna send you the Holy Spirit. So there's power coming, it's the Holy Spirit. He tells you the philosophy. So you're going to do it primarily the way that you're going to accomplish this task that he left you here for is as a witness. It will be your testimony, will be the most powerful thing that you're going to have in this time and space of the unknown. So it's gonna be who? It's gonna be those who follow Jesus, it's what power are you going to have? You're going to have the Holy Spirit. How are we going to go about doing this? We're going to do it as witnesses. And then what's the plan going to be? Well, he, he tells you right here. You're going to start where you're at, Jerusalem, because that's where they're sitting. So we're going to start here. And then he's going, and then you're going to go to Samaria and Judea, like place, the places around. Hey, next you're going to go to Taft, and you're going to go to the Delano. You go to Shafter and Wasco. And then where are you going to go? Ends of the earth. The plan is start where you're at and take it to the world. Start where you're at and take it to the world. John 14, 16 through 17, again says this. I'll read it to you again. It says, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. So it's not a temporary spirit. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because they don't know Jesus, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. As you read John chapter 14, it's very interesting because one of the things that you see here, Jesus say is, um, you know, no one's ever seen God. You can't see God. Uh, no man can gaze upon God. He's the invisible God. And so they keep asking him about God. And he's like, why do you need to see God? You've seen me. And if you've seen me, you know God. Jesus is the perfect 
physical representation, the embodiment of God. So if you see Jesus, you've seen God. If you want to experience God, you experience Jesus. Once you've experienced Jesus, you know everything there is to know about the Father because it is embodied in the Son. This is part of the nature of the Trinity. We're not going to get way, way into this. But, but, but Jesus is saying, listen, you, you have no need to see God. I'm right here in physical form. And then what he says is, and I'm going to send the spirit to you so that you can experience me all the time. Because the Holy Spirit will be your helper, my witness. He will essentially be Jesus for you 24-7. John 14 also says that because of the presence of the Holy Spirit, that we will do greater things than even Jesus did in terms of miracles and power. I mean, that is just greater things than Jesus. Listen, I've been arrogant, but I've never sat around and thought I'll probably be greater than Jesus. (laughs) Greater things than Jesus? The, 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 The Holy Spirit is so empowering, is so powerful in our life, is so equipping in our life, is so perfect in our life, that the fruit of that would be greater than the things that we saw Jesus do. Now, th- do you understand why people like me are so concerned with American Christianity? I want you to think about this. Jesus tells his disciples that the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives is going to be so powerful for us that we are going to be doing these works of ministry and testimony that are even greater than Jesus. And then you look at the American church. What? Spending all our time worrying about politics or struggling to forgive your neighbor because they mowed their lawn wrong or something silly? Overwhelmed by some bad day you're having? Jesus Jesus is saying like, I'm gonna send the Holy Spirit to dwell inside of you so so that the work that comes from you is so amazing that like you couldn't even predict how powerful that'll look. And we aim so low We set this bar so low in church. Like we're excited if like people showed up for 90 minutes. That is not the bar. That is not what Jesus is talking about. We get caught up in the struggles of life and the noise of life just all the time. We we tried to, when the elders went away uh, a year ago, to our retreat, we were working on church values, where we ended up working on church values. We were trying to encompass this somehow in words. This idea that like, you just, what, what, what Jesus has created in you when he saved you and then put his Holy Spirit in you is just so, the, the value of that, the identity of that is so different than what the American church continues to say that we just need to, you to understand the gap between what the culture is saying and what actually the Bible says. And then we said it this way about identity. It says, believers are God's treasured possessions. Sons and daughters of the king. We must realize this new identity by living dynamic, spirit-led lives with entirely new priorities and standards. Jesus is saying, listen, I'm not leaving you alone. The very presence of me will be here with you all the time. You don't have to wait for these specific moments to meet with Jesus. You don't wait like in the Old Testament for hoping that God will pour out his spirit on a king or a prophet because you can meet with Jesus now at any time. Verse nine, and when he had said these things, this is the last statement Jesus makes on earth, when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. I just want you to imagine that happening. Now, in the Old Testament, we see that a cloud is associated with the presence of God. So in, back in Exodus, when he's leading the Hebrew people, a cloud is actually uh, the presence of God. So this is a symbology that, that God often uses for us m- mere mortals to show his presence, right? Um, in, in the transfiguration, we actually see God again appear as a cloud. So, so we have some history of this. But... The, the, the apostles needed to see Jesus leave this earth physically. That was actually important. He didn't want to just blip out. And the reason for that, if you're wondering, like, why was that important? Well, listen, 
we have some major heresies that we actually have to refute in our culture. Do you know one of those heresies from the Mormon church is that Jesus didn't actually trans, uh, ascend at that point, but actually he went over to the American continent and he had a whole nother set of sheep over in the American continent and there's a whole nother gospel that happened over in America. Did you know that? And you know how we refute that? The Bible! No, he didn't take a transatlantic flight over to America. He ascended to heaven to the right hand of the Father. Those are not the same. As much as you like America, that's not the right hand of the Father. (laughs) The third thing that's happening here at the ascension is this. If you wanted to experience Jesus before this happened, Okay, you had to be in his presence. You had to find him, right? So if you were a wee little man, you had to climb up on a sycamore tree? Come on, huh, huh? Somebody got that. You had to wait in a crowd. You, you, had, you had to wave through the crowd and touch his garment. You had to cut a hole in the top of the roof and lower your friend in. What am I trying to say? Jesus, in, in his incarnation, was bound by the laws of physics. He was a human. You had to go to him to find him. But when he ascends and sits at the right hand of the Father, he sends the Spirit. When he sends the Spirit, you no longer have to wait to find him. Yes. Yes. So, so it's not like, man, I would love to see Jesus, but you know, it's hard to get to Jerusalem. It's, no, 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 no. And you don't, you don't go to a temple anymore. We, we don't have to wait for the Holy of Holies or the certain right day or a certain place. And there's nothing more holy about this building than any other place. You know why? Because now the presence of God dwells within you. Therefore, you get to experience the peace and presence of Jesus all the time. You don't have to wait for it. You're not going to miss him. In fact, the, the, the very power and presence of Jesus for the believer, that is present for you all the time, and there's not a point where he's silent and not talking to you. So if you're not hearing from Jesus, it's probably because you're not listening. Amen. And I guarantee you that there have been times in your life, if you follow Jesus for any real period of time, where you feel like God's not really talking to you, and maybe he's ignoring you, and I just have news for you, he's not You've stuffed up your ears and gotten a hard heart. And he's waiting for you. Man, is he waiting for you. Because he loves you. Because he, spent, he sent his spirit to change your heart, to write his law on you, to give you a heart of flesh, not a heart of stone. So, so Jesus needed to ascend because now there's no physical boundary on Jesus. Jesus rules cosmically from the right hand of the Father. Everywhere. Verse 10, verse 10. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Listen, um, I have a little beef with the angels, okay? They ask questions that make you seem dumb. When, when Jesus is resurrected and they run over to the tomb and, and they're in the garden looking for him, the angels go like, why are you looking for him here? I don't know, man. He died and they put him in the grave. Where would you look for him at? But they ask it like they're idiots. I'm like, that seems normal. You're watching Jesus go up into the sky on a cloud. And these are guys who are like, why are you looking for him there? I don't know. He just rode up. He surfed a cloud all the way to the. What, what do you mean? Why? Who, where else would I look? It's first century Palestine. It's kind of boring. That's not. Why are you looking for him there? They, they, what, 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 what kind of question is that? This Jesus who was taken up from you to heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Because there's a day, guys. There's a day when he's coming again. And he's not coming in peace. And he's not coming alone. And there will be no more controversy about who rules this world. Now, I told you at the beginning, <clears throat> a while ago, <clears throat> 
that I wanted to give you some application of why this actually matters. Why does the ascension matter to you and I in everyday life? And here's the first one, here's the first one. You and I, number one, we live in the in-between. We live in the in-between. It's like, is the kingdom come? Yes, but not yet. Yes, but not fully. Sort of, but not all the way. We live in the in-between. We live in the unknown. Because today, Jesus has risen to the right hand of the Father. Jesus has conquered death. Jesus has conquered Satan. Jesus has sent his spirit to live within us. And yet, let's be really honest, I am not what I want to be yet. Amen? Now, I'm not what I want to be yet. I'm not what I want to be physically. Like, I just had my knee give out. Why? Why do we have these, these achy, deteriorating, dying bodies? Amen? Oh. You know you're getting old when you can get hurt sleeping? <laughs> I'm not yet what I will be. I, 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 internally, like in terms of loving Jesus and struggling with sin and, and being able to live by faith even though sometimes circumstances are dark, I am not yet what I will be. We're still in this unknown. We're still in the in-between. And that's what the ascension actually tells us is Jesus saying, listen, I go to the right hand of the Father. The time in which I'm going to restore this kingdom fully is not even yours to know. I'm gonna send you power. I'm gonna put you on mission. And you work like crazy until the day I come back. We live in the in-between. And we're all in this process of transformation. It's just not done yet. I want you to think about this. Every single person, okay, every pastor, every spiritual leader, every church member, every single person that you've met who proclaims Christ, loves Jesus, is still sinful. Even you. And yet we've got to do life together. Do you see how messy that is? Man, that's messy. That's gonna be hard. That's the in-between. Think about how messy that makes life with all the circumstances of our life. We still live in a broken world. We still live in a world in which there are people that are far from Christ. We still live in a world that is deteriorating and breaking. We're in the in-between. We've talked about this before, but I, but I want to remind you that what Jesus does when he puts his spirit in, when he saves you, is he reestablishes your ability to have this vertical relationship with God. And this vertical relationship with God, that's what we were originally designed for. That's what worked perfectly in the Garden of Eden. That's what got destroyed in Genesis 3 because of the curse. It's what Jesus reestablishes is when he conquers death. We have this vertical relationship. And only when this vertical relationship begins to transform and get healthy do the implications begin to spill out over our horizontal relationships, which is the relationships with one another, with our spouse, with our friends, with other people, with our neighbors, with our Karens. Right? So, So when we have chaos in horizontal relationships, it's almost always because we, we have been ignoring this relationship. And if you ever actually want to see peace and contentment in these relationships, in any degree at all, it's going to mean that you started here because if you don't start here, you're not going to get here. And so when Jesus ascends to the right hand of the Father, one of the things that we're called to do over and over and over again in both the Old Testament and the New Testament is fix our eyes upon him, put our gaze upon him, take our minds and set them on things above. Why, why is he constantly using this imagery to try to get you to lift your mind and your eyes off of this world and put them on him? Because if you don't fix this, if you're not working on this, if you're not developing this, all of this is just going to be chaos. And, 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 and you'll, you'll see this, this, this. We should cling to this vertical relationship. We should be clinging to Christ. We should be setting our minds on, why? why? Like, have you ever, listen to David speak about the King David. He says, as the deer pants for water, so my soul longs for you. That is not a cute Instagram caption, 
okay? That's not for a coffee cup. What is he trying to express? I know that this has to be right. And when I experience chaos here, I need to look here. Not here. Stop looking for the solution out here. Stop looking for the fix out in these horizontal relationships, in worldly things. Psalm 27, David says this, one thing I asked of the Lord and that I will seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord, that's in his presence, all the days of my life. God, if you would just change me to continue to want you more, to seek you more, to seek after you more, to to, to turn my head off of my worldly circumstances and back onto you and run after you, everything down here finally gets better. David writes some of these psalms surrounded by his enemies trying to kill him. Because you think you got some problems with your bills, right? But until your creditors show up with swords, he had some severe circumstances and he was focused on God. That doesn't mean that he didn't realize he was in severe circumstances. We have plenty of lamenting from David as well. But he knew, man, I just need to seek the presence of the Lord. I just got, hmm. So number one, we're in the in-between. Number two, we were not left unequipped. He did not abandon you when he went to the right hand of the Father. The word that we see here in Greek used in Acts 1 for power is the word dynamis. Dynamis. You know what that sounds like. Dynamite. Explosive. Power. That's what this Greek word means, power or capacity to do something. And, and, And we, listen, the Holy Spirit is going to do two primary things in your life. The first one is going to convict you of sin. Holy Spirit is going to convict you of sin. Because the problem is that all the time, just by default because of that sinful nature, we're constantly slipping back into the, my sin's not that serious. Yours is, but mine's not. You know what I'm talking about. Everybody in their minds right now knows somebody that's really sinful. Boy, you know, that one guy. But we can justify our own sin really quickly. The Holy Spirit's job is to convict you. And it's a wonderful thing. And and it's our job to be so sensitive to it that when the Holy Spirit does something, you just respond. You don't even ask questions. You just respond. I'm sitting in a small group the other day, and uh, it was a couple weeks ago, and I'm talking to a a buddy of mine in a small group, and he really struggles with gentleness, which I recognize because I really struggle with gentleness. And so he's trying to justify it, and he says, um, he's not here right now. I hope he doesn't watch this video. Anyways. He says, uh, I just like to be direct. And I say, oh, direct is the word we use to essentially say, you're not worth my time to be gentle. And he's like, oh. And so we bow to pray, and the Holy Spirit's like, was that gentle? (laughs) I was like, oh. They said amen. I said, hold on. I need to apologize to you. Because the Holy Spirit said apologize. That was wrong. Why does that matter? That's what the Holy Spirit's for. (laughs) That's the whole reason. You're like, wow, that sounds humbling. Yes! That's the point. When the Holy Spirit convicts you of something, don't justify it. Go, okay. God didn't leave you unequipped. He wrote his law in your heart. It should feel wrong. It's the Holy Spirit speaking. It's a wonderful thing. Amen. Do you know the way leprosy works? I don't know if you know this. Leprosy is that disease that eats away at you. But the way it starts is that it actually numbs you so you can't feel pain. And then what ends up happening is you accidentally do really weird stuff where you cut yourself, you hurt yourself, you smash yourself, you don't feel any pain, you burn yourself. And so your flesh starts to fall off because you can't actually take care of it because you can't feel pain. And the last thing that you ever want to do is not feel pain because of sin. That's a hard heart. It leads to death. You want that pain. That pain says, oh, I'm out of God's will. Let me step into it. Amen? Okay. We aren't serious about our sin. That's one of the mistakes. The second thing the Holy Spirit's there for is we aren't really resting in him. Man, I I tell you guys, 
uh, in pastoral ministry, I, would, I wouldn't get anywhere at all if I couldn't have learned, if, I, if I'm not constantly learning how to rest in the Lord, and here's why. Um, you begin to suffer with the people that you're serving and you begin to rejoice with them and the problem is that there's lots of them so you have to do the same thing on the same days. So some days, on the same day, you're celebrating the birth of a baby and the death of a loved one. And the engagement for marriage and the divorce, I mean like, like literally in the same day, you're crying and weeping and laughing and you learn really quickly how to rest in the Lord how to realize that it is not your own power and your own performance that God is holding the standard up, but it is just throwing yourself onto the cross and going, Jesus, boy, I need you. I can't do this. And it's why the, the Spirit is there to encourage you. We, we don't live a performance-based faith. And I'm constantly having to remind myself of this when things are difficult, to just throw myself and rest in the Lord. And here's the last thing. Here's the last thing. We're not left unequipped. And the third thing is this. What we do here matters. We're in the in-between. We have the Holy Spirit. We know, we, we know the end of the story is written, but we're in the in-between. And, and the Bible says your life is a vapor. Your life is a mist. You're here today and just gone in a moment. That does not mean that what you're doing today does not matter. I'm gonna use a movie quote that was used for Hollywood, but I'm gonna use it better. In The Gladiator, he, there's a statement he says, uh, what we'll do here today will have echoes in eternity. What you do in the moments of your life that God has given you will have echoes in eternity. And the Bible tells you that. In fact, Jesus will tell parable after parable after parable about servants that he left and then came back to check on. That's you and I. What are you doing with the time that you have left on this earth in the in-between? He left you his spirit. He put the Holy Spirit inside of you. He gave you a heart of flesh. He wrote his law on your heart so you could be encouraged and convicted so that he even told you what the plan was. Hey, you're going to be a witness. You're gonna use your testimony to reach a dark world. And by the way, I'm coming back again. And when I do, you're gonna stand before me someday and I'm gonna say, what did you do with the time I gave you? Amen. What did you do with the time that I gave you? He's going to ask you to make an account for what you did, not in your own power, but in the power of the Spirit that he put in your very life. And listen, we can run down a list of places that we've frankly spent a great deal of time that didn't matter, or, or we can make a commitment to lean into the Spirit and just run wherever he leads us. That's not only his plan, by the way, it's his only plan. He says, Christ in you is the hope of glory. Yes. Not Christ in Pastor Daniel. Christ in you, say me. Christ in you is the hope of glory. He bought you with a price. He sent his very son for you to, to bleed on that cross. He conquered death. He rose again. He ascended to the Father, and then he put his spirit in you to be on mission. So here's my questions. Are you on mission? Are you on mi mission vertically? Are you seeking the Lord? Are you treasuring time with him? And none of it works if you don't. None of it works. Are you on mission relationally, the relationships in your life? And you're on mission with your priorities. I'm gonna pray for us. Uh, our prayer team and our elders are gonna be up front. We would treasure the opportunity to pray for you to walk with you through difficulties, to talk to you about what it looks like to put your faith in Christ or to take a next step of baptism. I will be up here for any reason that you wanna come and talk to us. We love you. Let me pray for us. Father God, we thank you so much for your word, for your son, God, for his time here on earth, his ascension into heaven, God, and his sending of the Holy Spirit to convict us and encourage us, to lead us, to prompt us and empower us, God. We want to do mighty things for you as witnesses on this earth and the time that we have left to make an eternal impact that will echo in eternity. God, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. You move as the Lord leads you.